Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, it's a pleasure to be back. John, it's been a while since you talked about Adamira and its Cook Mountain Project in Washington. Are you still watching for a discovery, or is Adamira dead? Well, at, we last talked about Adamira Minerals um, in April 2018, when uh, they had finally gotten approval to drill one of the targets that they had generated uh, with their geophysical survey, and this is in the northeastern part of uh, of Washington, where Ken Ross had operated the the, the, the Buckhorn uh, high grade gold mine, and then shut it down because they ran out of ore. And uh, Adamera had, uh, under Mark Kalibaba's leadership, had tackled this area and said, okay, was there anything that was overlooked? But uh, with the sort of small budgets that they were always working with, they never really could get a concerted program going, and they would find snippets. But they never found a new discovery where he said, aha, we have another crown jewel here that we can outline, uh, uh, you know, medium to high grade uh, underground gold deposit. You can't get the... Uh, you know, open pit stuff permitted in in northeastern Washington. Um, so the company just kind of died. And last year, 2019, was a horrible year for juniors. Uh, Adam Era just sort of sat there and 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 showed the project to different groups. Uh, it's got negative working capital. I had almost written it off as a zombie at the end of the year, but uh, in late January, the company announced a deal with Hoss Shield Mining, and this is the Peruvian uh, uh, gold and silver miner. They specialize in high-grade underground mine. So they've been doing deals in places like um, Nevada with uh, companies like Renaissance Gold, hoping to get lucky with either some Walker Lane uh, gold-silver epithermal play or some uh, high-grade uh, Carlin play, but they seem to have not had any luck in Nevada and have abandoned that. But they did a deal which allows them to earn up to 75% on the Cook Mountain project. Now, Adamara still has several other projects that are not part of the deal that they'll be able to focus on 100% uh, once this uh, you know project gets going. Uh, the first part of it uh, allows um, Hoshill to uh, earn um, $60% by spending uh, Eight million U.S. and that's a fairly big amount. What the market didn't really like uh, is that during the first two years, the firm commitment is only a half million U.S. But it is required to be done, so there will be money spent in the first two years. And of course, Hoshill can always accelerate it once it vests for um, um, uh, sixty percent, uh, and they have five years to do that. They can increase to 75% by uh, funding all costs to deliver a feasibility study over a three-year period, and they can extend that uh, by, by making some payment of several hundred thousand dollars. Uh, so, so if it's going to take longer to do a feasibility study, uh, they're not going to let the uh, timing deadline uh, kill that thing. So this is a really good development for Adamera. The stock has not responded. Uh, they still have to uh, disclose what their program is going to be, which parts of Cook Mountain uh, our shield is going to tackle. But there is still hope that this part of uh, northeastern Washington is going to deliver another high-grade gold discovery and uh, Hoshield is the ideal partner for this sort of development. This is what they specialize in. So Adamera is not dead. Cook Mountain is still alive, and it has a new shot at delivering a discovery over the next couple years. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, 
and on Frankfurt symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, whatever happened to the Bonita Copper Project of VR Resources? Well, VR Resources I got very excited about in uh, late 2017. In fact, our Discovery Watch episode was November 7th. Uh, um, VR Resources is headed by Michael Gunning, and they had generated a project in the northwestern uh, corner of Nevada, and uh, it, it's kind of like the far northern extension of the Walker Lane. You go 300-plus uh, kilometers to the south, and there's the Yarrington Copper Complex, uh, and that is just a copper producer. There's no gold to it, but what uh, what Michael saw up in the Bonita area was here's a system which has uh, outcropping high-grade uh, copper with some gold that others had looked at in the past. It's been limited drilling, uh, uh, but he said this is going to be a porphyry system that's going to be sort of deeper than normal, but there's a big alteration system here, and we're, we, you know, we've acquired it, and we put it into this shell. This is our new exploration uh, uh, strategy. And they did two programs in, in 2017 and 2018, and, and they failed to actually intersect ore grade mineralization where they had hoped to find it. Uh, uh, they now believe that the best target is in the eastern part where they have to drill under a, uh, a, a litho, litho cap, and that will require a deep hole, but that's not really the priority. In fact, even in 2018, the priority began to shift to the southern end of the Walker Lane where they had picked up the Danbo project, and this was a bunch of discrete uh, quartz veins with some high-grade gold that had never been fully explored. But but as, as, as Michael got his teeth into this whole area, he realized that there's a whole 5 by 20 kilometer corridor that's prospective for gold systems. And they staked several projects of which the Amzal project has emerged as a potential round mountain scale target with uh, and round mountain has like 18 million ounces. Uh, it would be a disseminated stockwork type system. They've generated the target. That's something that they will drill later this year. But the focus for the company switched in April of 2019. Michael had become frustrated by the high U.S. dollar relative to the Canadian dollar and uh, wanted to do some exploration in Canada. And way back in 2001, his mentor had talked about a, uh, a stream sediment survey that the Ontario Geological Survey had done in, in sort of northern Ontario in that whole area of the campus casing structural zone. It runs about 500 uh, kilometers from, from Lake uh, Huron all the way up to James Bay. And, and the northern half of it is it's just horrible flat swampland. The Archean basement is covered by uh, a younger 400 million year old uh, uh, marine shelf type of carbonate, limestone type uh, type of stuff. And uh, there's really uh, has not been much exploration done in this area except for uh, kimberlite targets uh, and carbonatites. In fact, Niobe Metals uh, 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 James Bay carbonatite was part of this whole group of geophysical targets that uh, were checked out in the 60s and 70s and, and investigated. But what this uh, survey had generated was a widespread anomaly of copper along with some fluoride, which was very odd because there was no explanation for it. And it stretched all the way from uh, so the James Bay area down quite far south, and uh, and and the you know the glaciers would have come through there and scraped it from wherever it came from, and then the the rivers which all drain into Hudson's Bay and and James Bay would have dragged a lot of it back there. So it's like a big giant uh, dispersed uh, copper halo, and and Michael began to wonder where 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 does this stuff come from. And it was only like 20 years, 18 years later that uh, when he was thinking about what his mentor had said, that he came back to this area and did, you know, a deep research analysis and saw, yeah, there's been lots of geophysical targets in the government data. The Beers has been in there testing them for kimberlite targets. Uh, some barren kimberlites have been found, but there's really uh, uh, been nothing interesting found. But he found one very large, almost 12-kilometer-wide uh, magnetic blob that didn't seem to be uh, 
didn't seem to have any historical exploration. And when he dug deeper, he found that in 1981, in, in rivers to the north and to the south, uh, where the rivers had cut down into the bedrock and, uh, and exposed some cold seams, there had been some uh, drilling in the past which had come up with some, uh, some copper, copper, copper uh, uh, mineralized cobbles for which there was never really any exploration. He said, you know, here's this big hole in the middle of this area and uh, it's got the copper geochem to the south and the north. Maybe this is an IOCG system, an iron iron oxide uh, copper gold system, similar to Olympic Dam. Basically, a big giant intrusion comes up, and it's, it's iron rich, and it's uh, it, it's got lots of fluids. It scavenges uh, other metals from the surrounding area. Maybe this magnetic target is something like that. And so they staked this in, 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 in April of last year, the Run Oak, and started doing gravity surveys and uh, uh, higher resolution magnetic sur- surveys. And out of this resolved that this big blob was actually seven distinct magnetic highs, one of which is two and a half kilometers high, and it's overlapped by a gravity anomaly. And they said, wow, this could be the... Uh, 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 IOCG style intrusion, and these things are monsters. Uh, um, you know, for example, the Carapatina found in Australia. Uh, this thing is a one percent uh, copper, half gram gold. Uh, uh, it's, it's a billion tons, but it's under like five hundred meters of cover rock. And, and the Australians sort of use geophysics to find these things and uh, and drill the holes. And they are ultimately underground mines. And in this area here. Uh, maybe you'll be able to have an open pit mine, uh, but, but it is kind of like a wetlands area. It, it's all swamp and bog, but you're looking for a high-grade copper gold system. So they drilled one hole in November and finished it in December, and and this they had done an IP survey too, and it lit up by indicating uh, sulfides, but it turned out the sulfides were pyrite inside the limestone, so that's obviously not the... Uh, the system. The second target that they started drilling uh, uh, early February is in the center of a magnetic low and a gravity high, and so they're hoping this is a part of the intrusive complex which has undergone magnetite destruction through hydrothermal fluid flow. So that hole is now underway. Everything's frozen there. It's the you know best time to drill there, and they will do the third hole which steps another 600 meters or so farther north and drills into the magnetic high where the gravity high also overlaps. So this is a very large target. There is peripheral geochemical evidence. It's never been drilled in the past. Uh, It's actually, although it's in the middle of this boggy wasteland, it's only 10 kilometers from a railhead. And uh, so if they were to find a copper, major copper deposit in this area, uh, it wouldn't take too much to add an extra rail spur to connect to the rest of the world. And, and of course, uh, um, the question people have, well, would this kick off an area play? And I asked him, he said, no, we know we've gone through all the mag targets in there. The, the past explorers have done a really good job. Uh, they've been, you know, turned out to be, you know, carbonatites that aren't very interesting, kimberlites that aren't very interesting, other mafic intrusions that aren't very interesting. Uh, this is the most likely explanation for all that copper in the stream sediments dispersed over this very large area. So we got two more drill shots. Uh, hopefully they flesh out the, the geological model that Michael Gunning has developed, uh, and we'll find out uh, probably by our early April what this is all about. So the Ranoki project is one potentially very high reward project uh, that Discovery Watch people should be paying attention to. And even if it turns out to be just, um, you know, a modestly mineralized uh, intrusion, they still have that AMSL project, which is uh, a large uh, uh, gold target in Nevada that they will get to later in the year. And they have a couple million dollars in the Treasury, so they don't have to finance right now while we wait to see where this coronavirus takes the global economy and markets in general. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. 
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, do you have any new Discovery stories for Discovery Watch? I do. And this, you know, Discovery Watch has been about pointing out potential discoveries and watching for a discovery to happen and take a stock, uh, you know, to the moon. And we haven't, since we launched this in 2016, really seen any great discoveries emerge, except, of course, the uh, Arizona Mining's Hermosa Taylor discovery. But here is one which made a discovery last year, and it did it through a, uh, you know, a systematic method that involves some innovative undercover uh, testing. The company is Osino Resources Corp. Um, they're not cheap. They're 80, 90 cents right now. They just did a $14 million financing at 78 cents. It's got groups like RCF uh, Opportunities, a Denver-based, um, you know, resource, uh, um, a venture capital outfit as a participant. It's got Ross Beatty as a major shareholder. And uh, uh, they are focused on Namibia. Now, the CEO is a person called Hayadon, and he had uh, originally been involved with an Ecuadorian play that got absorbed by one of um, Ross Beatty's companies, and that's how he got to know Ross Beatty. Then he ended up working with a company called Oryx Gold Corp, and this was kind of a Bay Street manufactured company. There was an earlier company called Teal Minerals, which had the Ochicoto project uh, in, 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 in Namibia, which was a gold system. It had a you know, couple of million ounces, and uh, Teal got acquired by uh, uh, African Rainbow and uh, Valet, for their Zambian copper assets, and then they spun out this gold asset in Namibia into Oryx, and it was, you know, brute force financing, you know, $48 million, raised $28 million to buy the project. And and what Hayadon did with uh, Oryx was they upgraded this from an inferred resource to an indicated and measured an indicated resource and did a PEA, and this attracted the attention of B2 Gold. By the end of 2011, before this bear market was really getting under, you know, fully underway, BT Gold did a paper bid, acquired it for $125 million worth of stock, has put it into production as a, as a, as a mine that's now producing, expected to have produced 178,000 ounces gold last year, and it's about a, a one point, uh, six uh, gram per ton grade, not super high grade, but their cost, all in sustaining cost, is uh, is about $900 an ounce. So it's a fairly low cost, open pit operation. And this is something relatively new for Namibia. Um, uh, much of Namibia is covered by sand, uh, and even worse, uh, within the sand there'll be a calcrete layer of really hardened sand that's been cemented together tough to get through and uh, there aren't a lot of these artisanal workings in this place where the the, the locals are fine where there's some high grade gold and dig pits and that's been sort of the exploration guide for companies as to where to go and the grades it's an orogenic uh, 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 system uh, you know we have a big big regional faults and you have splays and shears coming off it but unlike these ones in the say the Abitibi to be greenstone belts and these are key in terrains in Ontario where you get very high grades. Namibia is not blessed with high grades. But along these structures where you find these, these splays coming off, you do find mineralization in the one to three gram per ton range. And uh, it's near surface, it's obscured by sand and calcrete, and these are capable of uh, 
making very lucrative uh, open pit mines, as we've seen with the Ochi Coco. <laughs> now, the in the case of uh, what after Oryx got bought out, uh, Hyodon and his team tackled Namibia again, consolidated all these different properties in various areas, uh, a whole batch of them in the north where the Ochikoko Koto project is, but also a very large land position in uh, what they call the Karibib project in, in the southern part of this uh, Damara Orogen. And within the middle of this is the Navachab deposit, which Anglo Gold found in 1984, put into production in 1989 with an 800,000-ounce resource. And like six, seven years ago, it still had a reserve of or resource of 5 million ounces still going strong. So these systems, once you get into it and keep exploring, they just keep going and going. Well, one of the things that uh, Hyatt did was um, they reinterpreted the regional magnetics and r recognized this um, Caribbean fault zone. It goes for about 100 kilometers. It's a sort of crustal scale fault. The, like those types of faults usually uh, uh, do, it doesn't have any gold itself. But they said this is the controlling feature. So that's why they acquired a lot of land along the trend of this fault. And, uh, and then they started doing exploration. They did soil geochem. They would get these big sort of generalized smudges. Uh, they did the geophysics, and they could see that uh, um, there were magnetic trends, which were probably structures uh, with which the big giant clouds were uh, uh, associated, but they really didn't know where to begin. So they borrowed a technique from Australia, which uh, involved uh, you, uh, the theory that uh, in, in systems like that that are sand-covered with a calcrete layer in it, there's always water circulating through them. Uh, it uh, dissolves gold that's exposed at the bedrock, but when the water flow hits the calcrete, for some reason the upper part of the calcrete absorbs a portion of that gold payload. And uh, if you drill into this area, you can get five parts per billion grade. Now, that's not ore grade anywhere near, but they found that uh, when you find, when you drill into the uh, uh, calcrete and just sample the upper part, you can get a much more focused target. And that is what they developed in what they call the Twin Hills portion of the Karabiba project area. And last summer, they drilled it, and by August, they had intersected gold mineralization. So they now have evidence for the uh, method that this method is very good for homing in on which of these magnetic uh, structures are likely to be mineralized. They, they have like a 25-kilometer trend of this. Uh, uh, with the money that they now have in the Treasury, they're able to uh, start delineating the, the Twin Hills discovered, central discovery itself and start building a resource. But they now have the ability also to duplicate this over and over along other targets within this uh, Karabiba fault structure trend. Plus, they have the other projects uh, uh, to the north in the Ochikoto area where, where they can do similar type of strategy. So Namibia is is opening up. It uh, hasn't been a you know big world-class gold producer because the grades aren't very high. It's had this uh, sand cover obscuring everything. Uh, uh, the artisanal workers haven't had anything to really focus on and show the majors and the juniors where they should be drilling for uh, for rich gold deposits. Uh, so this is uh, a different type of Discovery Watch story in the sense that a discovery has already been made and the company's got a valuation of about a $100 million, but it's the kind where you can start building millions and millions of ounces from multiple zones within this large land package using a strategy that they developed with the help of science. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. My guest has been John Kaiser, and if you have any questions for John, you can fire them off to his website, kaiserresearch.com, or you can uh, drop an email to us at info at howstreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.